everybody it's so good to see everyone especially on this important topic at this important time i'm dr rodney glasgow and i'm an alum of the g shed hol elp program and just so excited to be in a room where folks know what all those acronyms <laughs> stand for and you know this is hosted by hol's anti-racism advisory committee and so i want to give just a very quick overview of what that committee exists to do so we start with the National Museum of African American History and Culture's definition of anti-racism, which is anti-racism is the policy and practice of opposing racism and promoting racial understanding and equity. It requires taking a hard look at the policies and systems that perpetuate racism. It calls on everyone to back up their anti-racist beliefs and values with actions that lead to equity in social systems and institutions, as well as everyday actions, interactions, and relationships. We believe that being racist or anti-racist is actually not about who you are, it's about what you do. Anti-racism takes diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts into a new level of inclusion and equity. The acronym JEDI that you'll hear us talking about and using signals the shift because it brings in the J, it brings in justice alongside equity, diversity, and inclusion to signal a deeper commitment to actively dismantling hidden invisible structures, practices, policies, and cultures of oppression. And for us here in HOL at GW, this is what ERAC will do. The proposed mission of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee is to encourage and guide the HOL faculty and staff in its efforts to catalyze change in HOL from a DEI culture to a Jedi anti-racism culture that respects and engages all people in an open and inclusive learning community. We are a part of a larger community Yes, this definition is somewhere where we can access it. We're part of a larger resolution and commitment from GW's Faculty Senate. And so what a better time and better place, and there's no more important time or question than this one. If you look at the news and what's going on in our country around CRT, education from preschool all the way through higher ed. And so I'm excited to be here and excited to turn it over to my sister and dear friend, Dr. Julia Storberg Walker. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Duane. Um, uh, yeah, thank you also for those of you who have worked behind the scenes Victoria Mikuleski, Torin Waters, and Dex Burns. Um, welcome, everyone, and hello. And thank you for making the choice to attend today. My name is Julia Storberg Walker, and I serve as chair of the Human and Organiz Organizational Learning Department and a co founder of the Anti Racist Advisory Committee on the Faculty End. Our department serves both master's and doctoral students, and our doctoral program is recognized globally as a leader in educating for leadership, innovation in learning, change, and organizing. And we have a strong cadre of hundreds of doctoral alumni spread across the globe who continue to reach out and serve our department in multiple ways, and many of them are here today. Thank you. Our master's program focuses on leadership and learning as the two primary levers to catalyze change and transformation in business, healthcare, nonprofits, government, educational settings, and others. So our work demands justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Organizing, leading, and learning are capabilities needed now more than ever in a world of political conflict, COVID, ecosystem collapse, and economic polarization. Human and organizational learning faculty, staff, students, and alumni have different views of these challenges for sure, but I think it's fair to say that every single one of us wants to, in our own unique way, make the world a better place. To me, this version of our work must be grounded in an ethic of justice, reciprocity, and compassion. We must know that we are completely interdependent and act with care for each other and the planet. We must culti cultivate our talents guided by these principles in service to our students, to the dignity of all, human and non-human alike. 
and to my white relatives, we must develop the capacity to bravely, to bravely open ourselves to, witness, and take responsibility for our violent history. Guided by those who have suffered and experienced oppression from the history that we have named, we must humbly serve to enact our collective liberatory future. This Embrace Speaker Series is one mechanism for all of us to bravely step into that collective future and the HOL department is so pleased and grateful to sponsor Dr. Zeus Leonardo today. At this time, Dr. Wright, please introduce Duane, um, Dr. Leonardo and say a bit about today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Julia Stobel Walker. Uh, on behalf of our leadership, Dean Michael Foyer, um, our Associate Dean Colin Green, I bring you welcome and greetings um, to here to the GW, and more importantly, to the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Uh, I'd like to start off today by just putting out a little bit of a land acknowledgement. And I always just read this and I'll put it in the chat um, because I still think it's very important uh, not to do this in a performative way, but to acknowledge the land we serve on. So as a faculty member, I acknowledge that George Washington University is settled upon the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Acostean peoples who served as stewards of these lands uh, for generations. I will place this land alignment into the chat function here for you to review, and I encourage you to do your own research um, on the information um, entailed in with. Thank you uh, to our Department uh, of Human and Organizational Learning uh, for stepping up to the plate and for your continued assistance uh, within the struggle for social and racial justice. Uh, this is a GSHED event, but more importantly, it is a uniquely HOL event. And the alumni, the faculty, the students, and the staff of HOL have got together uh, to decide to do this. And as a director of diversity and equity inclusion initiatives at GSHED, I wanna just give a very personal and public thank you to Dr. Julia Stolberg Walker and the human and organizational leadership department for your partnership uh, within this struggle. Um, next, uh, we have about, uh, thank God, over 80 people here with us uh, today. Um, and that probably is 100% attributed to both the quality of the speaker we have and the excitement uh, about this topic. Uh, I will say that all events we have here at GW and particularly here at GSHED uh, are done in the spirit of learning please come within that spirit here today. Uh, we understand that this topic may be in some other realms controversial, uh, but we are all here to learn. And we all ask that you engage in the chat and you engage with the speaker during Q&A uh, within that spirit of uh, learning, investigation, and curiosity. Um, if for whatever reason, someone decides uh, to uh, violate that duty and to go beyond that spirit of curiosity, um, as a private university, uh, GSHED uh, will uh, remove you from this program. We don't wanna do that. And that is not to censor you, um, both uh, ourselves, and I'm sure Dr. Leonardo will uh, welcome pushback if it is respectful. Um, so I just want everyone to know that uh, before we get started. Now to the introduction. So one of my mentors, the late great Dr. Uh, Freddie Davey, for whom the Honors College at the historically Black College University, Hampton University is named, once told me that the hardest thing to do is to introduce someone who needs no introduction. Um, she said that to me uh, when I had the honor and the privilege of introducing the governor of Virginia. And I was writing it, I was writing it, and she said, you're just gonna go up there and say, ladies and gentlemen, the governor of Virginia. Everyone knows his bio. Uh, I have that feeling now with our speaker today, but I've been given this impossible task, so I will try to do it anyway. I will start today by saying, and this is not to date our speaker, that I first heard about Dr. Zeus Leonardo uh, when another professor, the Dr. James Banks, uh, told me about him when Zeus was at the University of Washington. I say that not to date Zeus because at that point in time, I think Zeus was a young scholar 
that I was not even yet in undergrad, <laughs> much less Dr. Dwayne Wright. I share that with you, again, not to date our speaker, but to show how remarkable a career he has had and how long he has been in the struggle, been part of the game, and actually given the sacrifice, produced the knowledge you are about to see here today. There are some uh, also comrades and you know bandwagons to this controversy on critical race theory, on race analysis. Dr. Zeus Leonardo is not one of them. He has been doing this for an exceptionally long time. Uh, it's often said that uh, Tanahasi Coates, who is now at Howard University, is the spiritual and intellectual uh, sort of uh, inheritor of the legacy of James Baldwin. We just lost someone, Charles W. Mills, a great Caribbean Jamaican philosopher. And I would like to say to the audience today that if I can be so bold, Dr. Zeus Leonardo is both the spiritual and intellectual heir to the legacy of Charles H. Mills as he just left us. And with that, I will read his bio, which does not do him justice. Dr. Zeus Leonardo is a professor and was recently Associate Dean of Education uh, and the faculty of the Critical Theory Distinguished Emphasis at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and a past vice president of AERA's Division G, and for those who don't know, that's the Division for Social Context of Education. He was a co-editor of the Review of Educational Research from 2011 to 2014, and he has been on the editorial board of 15 journals, including, but of course not limited to, Educational Researcher, AERJ, as well as the Associate Editor for North America of Race, Ethnicity, and Education, one of the premier journals dealing with race in the field of education. He has been a visiting a professor in several universities, including the University of Colorado, the University of Washington, where he was the acting director for the Center for Multicultural Education way back in 2005. Now I've dated myself a little bit. He has authored or edited 10 books, including uh, Race Frameworks, uh, the book that today's talk uh, will generate from, the second edition of Education and Racism, and his most recent work, Egbert Sand, Sad and Education. His articles and book chapters critically engage race, class, gender stratification and education, democratic schooling and the uh, concept and theories that go with that, diversity in multiple forms, including epistemological and ontological difference. His work is interdisciplinary and brings together insights from sociology, contemporary philosophy and race and ethnic studies. He has received several recognitions, including the Derrick Bell Legacy Award from the Critical Race Studies and Education Association. In addition, his, as invitations in the US, Professor Leonardo has delivered keynotes uh, all around the world, including in England, Sweden, Canada, and Australia. GW, GSHED, our friends, our competitors, <laughs> uh, co-conspirators. We are honored here today to learn with and from Dr. Zeus Leonardo, and it is my pleasure to introduce him right now. Thank you, Zeus. Professor Wright, uh, dear Duane, that is one of the warmest introductions I've ever had in my life. And uh, so, so, so many thanks and so much appreciation to you. Julia Storberg uh, uh, Walker here on screen, Rodney Glasgow, the team in general, uh, the invitation from GW and the audience here, um, you know, nearing a hundred people. That, 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 is, that is the best sign of engagement. The word engagement is actually a key word here in my talk because uh, we don't have that much time. So af after uh, that warm introduction and the, uh, um, seeing your faces on the screen. I, I am, uh, I'm just heartened to, to be here with you today to talk about something important, something current, and something that is on the mind of many people, particularly in the context of DC, because in a sense, it was about a year ago that uh, uh, former President Trump and other cabinet members, et cetera, put CRT on blast, as it were, and now we're dealing with um, 
laws and policies about CRT in, in several states and even more states than that making statements about CRT. So without further ado, I'm really gonna just jump into this because I do want us to get to the Q&A. And so uh, let me begin by, um, there you go, there's the uh, slideshow. That's my title. Next uh, screen, please, that's Who's Afraid of Race Analysis? All right, next screen. There you go, that's the presentation structure. And so basically my, my task today is, is, is to talk about the critical uptake of race. Now, a lot of people will pin that on CRT or critical race theory, but I think we need to understand the broader um, uptake of critical race. And I know at least four critical frameworks and CRT being the first, the second that I'll go over in the structure of this presentation is Marxism, which has its own um, analysis of race. And it is in quotation marks oftentimes, I'll explain why that is. Uh, that way in Marxism. Uh, third is the framework of whiteness studies, where the two, frame, uh, the two main strategies have been reconstructing whiteness and abolishing whiteness. I'll speak to that. Fourth is the cultural studies and politics of representation. Um, uh, usual suspects there may, may, may be familiar to you, such as Stuart Hall, which is to suggest that the politics of representation and the regimes of meaning about race is where we want to focus on. Um, and then lastly, I've been playing around with this phrase that I'm calling race ambivalence. And I will talk about that as a combination of all these four frameworks that I'll end with. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so I'll begin with CRT because that is the one that has uh, made the news for us in the last year. So in the US, CRT is the dominant framework indeed for a critical study of race and education. In fact, its acronyms popularity may suggest that CRT is no longer a curiosity, but a household name, much like Coke becomes a synonym for soda. Now that is an unintended consequence of putting CRT on blast in the last year is that it has then escaped legal discourse, legal scholarship, so that folks who might have had some, you know, semblance of a, a curiosity about race analysis or even a critical race analysis, heard about CRT for the first time, including my own children. So I have you know, some young children um, too, and, and um, at least one of them who was in high school at the time would come home and talk about CRT, not because his own father writes about it, but because their teachers talked about it, that their friends, their social media talked about it. So. Uh, an unintended consequence of, of, of putting CRT on blast in social media is that it has made it even more popular to people who didn't know about it. So it suffices to say in CRT that race and racism are endemic to US society. And we should be reminded that CRT is indeed, as a paradigm, as a paradigmatic study of race, is a US innovation and invention. It came out of legal studies here, not the least of which is Derek Bell's writings in the late 70s and, and 80s. And then on to his students who sort of, you know, his disciples who followed him and other folks who, who um, came into the fold. So this is just off the bat to suggest that CRT did start from this land. And thank you for the land acknowledgement, Dwayne Wright, of the indigenous people who have been custodians and cultivators of this place. Now, this does not suggest to CRT that racism is pandemic, to use an appropriate word today, or out of control and cannot then be ameliorated, even to, to use today's word, canceled. CRT is precisely that intervention that aims to halt racism by highlighting its pedagogical dimensions such that race is learned and affirming an equally pedagogical solution rooted in a politics of anti-racism. In this, CRT displays what I call chutzpah or chutzpah, or at least a theory with an attitude to recall uh, some music uh, uh, reference now dating myself back to the eighties, right? So thank you. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of the, and, and thank you for, oh, Dwayne White, uh, you know, thank you for that compliment about uh, Charles Mills and my connection with him. We lost a, a, a soldier and warrior in the struggle, Charles Mills recently. There is and still uh, are 
memorials coming through in the social media. So please pay attention to that. These are some of the uh, recommendations and inspirations for my work and no doubt for other people's work in CRT. On my right here is the, the famous book by Derek Bell, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And I'm going to uh, highlight the phrase at the bottom, the subtitle, The Permanence of Racism, right? I'm gonna come back to that in a second. And uh, a great inspiration for my own work, The Racial Contract, Charles Mills. And in my conversations with Charles, the, the original title he thought of was from critical class theory to critical race theory. That was an original title that he toyed around with, but he finally settled on the racial contract because his book really does deal with a critique of the social contract. But originally, critical race theory was going to be in the title. Next slide, please. So, in 1995, particularly in education, we all remember the famous essay, what I call the essay that launched a thousand books. And I hope some folks remember that reference in literature. The book, the, the essay that launched a thousand books uh, was Gloria Latson Billings and Bill Tate Jr.'s essay in um, Teachers College Record, right? That talked about the introduction of critical race theory in education. And so what we have is, here is a, con a continuity. I wouldn't say that CRT, it represents a break from multiculturalism, but a continuity, right? Even if it's an heir apparent to multiculturalism as we go forward from here. So that we've had since the 1970s from uh, um, Professor Wright's reference to Jim Banks's work early on, the insurgent multiculturalism of the 70s to its mainstreaming by now. Uh, and in between that, uh, the fighting of the cultural wars of the 1990s. But CRT does have its official beginning that most people don't argue about, which is 1995 in the Lads and Billings and Tate essay. So we have here a continuity of the uptake, the uptake of race from multiculturalism to CRT. And it looks like CRT is the heir apparent in a dominant analysis of race in education. I would say a critical analysis of race. And here we return to that subtitle of Derek Bell's book, The Permanence of Racism. And um, sometimes when I give talks like this, there's a temptation for the audience to, because by the end you might get the impression you know, uh, or ask the question of what, what's the good news? What's the good, you know, what's the good in this? And, you know, there's a lot of negativity. And by negativity, I mean a politics of negation in critical race theory that comes from the, the critical tradition, the politics of negation, which is in a sense, a kind of politics of negating a negative situation. And so the permanence of racism to some people is, is, is harsh. And it is because it's describing a harsh situation. And empiricism is on Professor of the late Derek Bell's side. Empiricism is on his side because we have hundreds of years of data and evidence that racism looks permanent. So on that level, he seems right. But I think it also serves another purpose, what Professor Bell called a defiance. So that the suggestion that racism is permanent in our society asks the question of how would then that change your analysis? of race and racism in daily life? How would that then um, change your action and your behavior if you assume that racism were permanent, right? And it is a form of defiance to suggest that um, even in situations that are setbacks, such as you know, the storming of the Capitol uh, that we, we saw, you know, even in those moments of setbacks, how can we perform a CRT analysis in defiance of these setbacks, of looking forward? Now, we, we might remember that at AERA during the time of Obama's campaigning, uh, that Professor Bell was a speaker in a huge auditorium, and he was wearing an Obama hat. So he, he, his notion that racism is permanent is not in the absence of hope in a future, right? So CRT, uh, an insurgent uh, legal discourse in the 80s, really brought this analysis of race in the law and not just racism in the most obvious places like criminal law. The suggestion was that the entire edifice of law itself was racialized from the obvious criminal system and uh, prison system all the way down, all the way, all the way down to inheritance laws, real estate and tax laws. And education took the baton from this and suggested that 
education itself is racialized, is the institution itself is racist. Now it's not hopelessly racist. It's not hopelessly racist. So if, if there's any silver lining in the negativity of CRT, it is the suggestion that in analyzing this racism that is, is, is endemic in what the institution of education represents, it is in defying that in, in through our analysis. So, and it's not like law or CRT in the law, right? Education is not just racist in the achievement gap in the most obvious sense. That's now being questioned, for example, in the, you know, the falling use of standardized tests in, in undergrad and, 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 and the GRE in graduate school uh, uh, applications, right? But that is not just the achievement gap, but all the way down all the way down to the over-referral of Black students in, in, in special ed, right? The over-disciplining of Black students, we know this happens. Um, even down to even mundane things, such as where do kids hang out during lunch breaks, right? Where are they sitting in the cafeteria according to Beverly Daniel Tatum's great book title, right? So i.e. the everyday life of schooling itself is saturated in every nook and cranny with race and arguably racism. Now, the tenets uh, have been very, we've made a lot of the tenets in CRT and we have our own in uh, education. Uh, next slide, please, We're through um, Professor Solorzano and Coley. And it is that uh, to, to, to abridge these tenets to five, it is that race and racism are central. This is some way, a point I've already made. So that it is not only central, but it intersects in multiple ways with other forms of subordination, gender, class, and citizenship among them. Two, that it challenges the dominant perspective, what we call sometimes majoritarian perspective, right? To recenter marginalized perspectives. Not that those perspectives are right, not that those per perspectives are accurate by virtue that they come from a certain population, but that you begin the analysis there. We sometimes call this epistemic privilege, right? Epistemic privilege from feminism. It is not that those perspectives are right, but it takes our analysis in a different direction depending on from where you begin. Or as the late Charles Mills said, if you begin with this, then you have that, right? Three, a commitment to social justice. That CRT research isn't just satisfied with describing the world as it is, but it is about intervening in that world. Not dissimilar to what Marx once said that philosophy has hitherto described society, the point is to change it, right? Four, we value experiential knowledge. This is a questioning of the objective or objectivism in social research to the extent that, you know, we listen to and value and elevate particularly communities of colors, perspectives and narratives as testimonies to their experiences with racism. And finally, that this is interdisciplinary. You know, one must ask the question of, is it enough to ask, you know, what psychology has to offer when it, un when it understands racism? Obviously that's helpful, but racism isn't answered just through how psychology or sociology or law what um, has to offer for analysis because it's much more complex. Therefore, we need a much more complex uptake about race, critical, and theory. Next uh, slide, please. Now I step into Marxism, which is a second critical framework for understanding race. This is one that a lot of people arguably aren't used to because uh, uh, correctly speaking, uh, most people understand Marxism as offering analysis or critical analysis of class. But Marxist theories of racism um, do offer fundamental challenges to race thinking and race thought, where they argue that race, in quotation marks here, is unavoidably caught in a reification of what is at heart an ideological or made up concept. In short, within a Marxist framework, a critical study of race is not a study of race, in fact, at all but an analysis of class antagonism found within capitalism, which gives rise to the reality of racial division, but which itself is not caused by racial structures per se. This is to, this is to suggest that a Marxist inspired version of race scholarship is not a racial analysis of race, 
but a class analysis of racialization, right? This is very tricky for some. And I, you know, all four frameworks have some promise and um, all of them also have problems to work through. So this is not about any of these paradigms being the correct um, form of analysis, but I, I take from them all and, and I try to extend them all. Here, uh, next slide, please. Here, some of the books that you might think about reading are Robert Miles on my left, Racism After Race Relations, or Antonia Darder and Rodolfo Torres's book After Race, right? Uh, we, we can claim uh, Andarder in our own discipline of education. And here, uh, next slide, please. The suggestion here um, is that in that couplet, the metaphorical couplet that Marx uses of the base and struct, uh, superstructure, that economic history, economic production happens in the base. Just think of it as the factories where things are produced are in the base. Whereas the superstructure, everything, everything that is ideological, culture, religion, right, media, pop, you know, popular life, it, including education, what else is there called the ideological state apparatus? Race is also found in the ideological superstructure. And race is in scare quotes here because in Marxism, race itself is not real like the economy is real. Now that, Marxists are not silly. They understand race's importance, but they have certain concepts they like to use. For example, determining versus dominant, right? So that race may be dominant in our social formation, but to the Marxists, race is not determining. Class is determining. In a word, as a scientific concept, class is what causes other things, according to Alex Kalinikos, the Marxist. So to the Marxist, race is ideational, in fact, ideological. It is real life, it is real seeming, and has um, sort of um, some hyper-real parts of them. Now, there you go, a dominant versus determining. So to, 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 to the Marxist doctrine, race is descriptive versus class is analytical. In physics, for example, Right? We used to think that Earth was the center because it described what we thought was happening versus what was really happening was that the Earth was going around the sun, which is heliocentric. That is a rough analogy of how Marxism regards race, which is that it, you know, by, by all practical purposes, we experience it as, as, as real, whereas to them, it goes around the sun of class. So to, to the Marxists, races in quotation marks, but racism ra and racialization, according to Robert Miles, is what's happening. The racialized division of labor, for example. Next slide, please. Now, the third framework is more new. It's roughly about, it's a little over 30 years old, if by that we mean that it began with something like Peggy McIntosh's white knapsack argument, right? Um, but there is argument about where this might begin. If you, if you trace farther back, you can say that James Baldwin, whom um, Dwayne Wright mentioned uh, beforehand, um, was really key in talking about uh, the price of the ticket of whiteness. Um, before that, W.E.B. Du Bois's work on the souls of white folk, which is a secondary source after the, the souls of black folk, of course. Now, in whiteness studies, I, I don't have so much a problem with beginning it with Peggy McIntosh, but that begins from a certain perspective on what it is, you know, this kind of institutionalized study. You know, you can write dissertations on it. There are conferences. There's a political economy to whiteness studies that is roughly 30 years old. And I would say it is a racial intervention led mostly by white authors. I happen to be known in whiteness studies. And, you know, you might ask, what's a nice man of color like you? doing in a place like whiteness studies. So, I, I, but I have no problems um, identifying whiteness studies as, as a largely white scholar uh, led intervention, even if folks like myself are part of it. But here whiteness and whites come to the center of an analysis in, un, in an unprecedented and unforeseen way. This is different from the centering that whiteness is usually, usually afforded or that white folks are accustomed to in Eurocentric curricula 
as a point of reference for civilization, progress, and rationality. Right? In whiteness studies, whiteness becomes the center of critique and transformation. To use the heliocentric analysis differently, it is the sun of our problem. In a word, it is the problem to be posed, if not also to be solved. Now, this reminds us of the tongue-in-cheek ironic question that Du Bois once asked about how does it feel to be a problem, which he asked Black folks. Now, of course, he was tongue-in-cheek because Du Bois didn't see Black people as the problem. So the real question, the, the, question, the, the, the phrase behind that question is, how does it feel to be perceived as the problem, right? Here, in a word, it's being asked again, but now it's not just how does it feel to be a problem to white folks? That's, that's the question. How does it feel to be the problem, right? That's the question of whiteness studies. Now here, there are two significant camps, white reconstruction and white abolition that I'd like to go over. Next slide, please. A couple of reading suggestions for you. The Wages of Whiteness, a historian, David Rodiger, about how the American white working class was made. And one of, you know, a great book that I really, you know, have, I've, I've written several essays that are framed by Dandika's book, Learning to Be White. And I'll speak to these two books in, um, in just a second, particularly Learning to Be White. Next slide, please. So in whiteness studies, there is a difference between whites and whites, right? It's less, it's less driven by the question, who is white? I would say, because that changes according to history, right? The Irish were not white. Italians were once not white. Jews were not white and had to become white. In fact, I think the Jewish white question is one of our great modern questions about whiteness because there's still a question mark on Jewish whiteness today in a way that there isn't behind being Irish, right? And so my question isn't about who is white because that changes. My question in whiteness studies is what is whiteness? as an ideology, as a material structure, and what is it doing? What is it accomplishing? I've already asked, how does it feel to be the problem, right? And so therefore, whiteness as a historic, is a historical process where, for example, uh, uh, the legal cases of, of Bagat Thind and Osaka, right, um, who followed each other in, in law only months after each other, where Bagat Thind um, Os uh, no, Osaka came first, and Ozawa, I'm sorry, um, came first where he sued for his citizenship as a Japanese American because he argued that culturally speaking, he was more uh, quote unquote white or Caucasian than other whites who were more recent um, come alongs like the Irish. And the Supreme Court struck it down saying that Culturally, you may have rights to claim whiteness, but anthropologically speaking, right? Physically speaking, physical anthropologically speaking, at that time in the early 1900s, you are not Caucasian. So you may be white, but you are not Caucasian because Caucasian is a word that describes the Caucasus Mountains, right? Which anthropologically speaking is the birth site of whiteness itself, anthropologically speaking. Right, And so his claim to citizenship was struck down by the Supreme Court of the US. And only, I believe, about five months later, the, the Thin case, uh, you know, a Southeast Asian uh, man, his claims to citizenship were taken away, taken away by the Supreme Court, exactly in the opposite direction by the same Supreme Court, written by this, um, uh, the opinion being written by the same Supreme Court uh, um, justice, which is to say this time he might, then might have claims to Caucasian because he comes from that part of the world near the Caucasus Mountains, right? Near India or below uh, Russia at the time, um, Asia Minor. And so physically, anthropologically speaking, he comes from the right Ge geography of the globe. But culturally speaking, commonsensically speaking, the Supreme Court said, but anybody who looks at you would claim that you are not white. And so what happens here is a fight between science on one hand, which was claimed by anthropology, claiming 
Caucasian status against Ozawa, right? But claiming it for Thin versus common sense cultural discourse, right? For Ozawa, but now against Bagat Thin. So this is what I call the, you know, the sort of strange thing called whiteness over uh, history, right? Now, what's happened um, since Peggy McIntosh's great knapsack argument is that we, we now have a good understanding of, of white privilege. But I think we have turned, especially recently uh, in the last 12 years or so, towards an analysis of white supremacy, which I, in my own writing, I, I've explained as um, the cause. Now, going back to determining from Marxism, I'm using a little bit of that kind of understanding that white supremacy is the structure, right? And that white privilege, therefore, is the effect, right? So that white supremacy is the cause of white privilege. It makes sense of white privilege exists. So I think this is my own sort of intervention in the literature that white su supremacy is going to have to be talked about. And the unintentional consequence of the last four years, including to the unintentional consequence of the last year with regard to putting CRT on blast, is that white supremacy is not part of popular language, right? When you listen to NPR, National Public Radio, and you're hearing, right, the, 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 the names, uh, the voices of people you're familiar with mentioning white supremacy regularly, there's something different that has happened. I would have never thought it would gain that kind of popularity so quickly, right? So the unintended consequence is now is that now more people are talking about both CRT and white supremacy. Now, finally, the two strategies we favor in this, in this analysis is to reconstruct versus abolish whiteness. Reconstruction is the, is the, um, is the, the philosophy that whiteness is bound up with whites and whites, is, whites are bound up with whiteness. They're one and the same, the heads and tails of a coin. And that if there are many ways to be white, for example, John Brown, right? And other abolitionists, anti-racist whites, therefore we can't reduce whiteness as helplessly and hopelessly racist, right? Therefore, whites like whiteness are redeemable and therefore reconstructable or, um, um, ha, you know, can be re-upped or reimagined. Versus to Rodiger, the book, uh, Wages of Whiteness, the suggestion is that whiteness is nothing but false and oppressive, right? Now that doesn't necessarily mean that every white folk is nothing but false and oppressive, but whiteness as an ideology, as a structure, is nothing but false and oppressive, and therefore it can't be redeemed. Right? Whereas whites can be redeemed. The trick here is, what are they redeemed as? The suggestion in the literature is that they can't be redeemed as white in the end. They have to become something else. That's a longer discussion I don't have the ability to talk about here. It's in my writing and other people know about it. Please read more on that if you're interested. Um, finally, that, we, uh, that whites learn to be white. That suggestion by Tandika is that whites are not born white. They have to become white. And her suggestion is that white children who were not white originally, they were born human. Little by little, they have to be abused into becoming white humans. And this abuse is sometimes physical, right? Of being physically disciplined into whiteness, such as being bullied into whiteness. That's a phrase I like to use, whiteness as bully. But also it's psychological and cultural. And it becomes with caretakers and guardians, not the least of which the more important caretakers and guardians are, of course, the white family, parents, et cetera. But it extends to the white nationhood as a caretaker, the white social system, the white social welfare, the white governance system. They also discipline and abuse white humans into whiteness. That is a very provocative statement. I would totally recommend reading that book. Next slide, please. So finally, in cultural studies, what we have is a, a, a politics of representation, right? That the suggestion that the representations we use to talk about race and whiteness 
themselves are part of, not separate from, or mirroring the structures of whiteness, right? Just as the spoon that you use to, to eat your dinner with, the particles in the spoon join the particles of your food in the plate. Um, the representations we use out there are themselves part of the racialized condition. So they're not separate from the reality that, for example, Marxism spoke about, right? The representations we use are themselves part of the reality. Here's an example. Next slide, please. Right here are some uh, inspirations for this kind of work. Edward Said on the the representation of the Orient. Uh, um, you know, insights I've written about recently in my own book on Edward Said. Um, if you're interested, uh, next slide, please. Right. Now here we turn from the means of production and owner, owning it in Marxism to the production of meanness, of how we make racial subjects every day. And so that whiteness again returns here as not only the owners of the means uh, of production, but owners of the production of meanness, right? Here the language assumes a central part of our analysis. No language, therefore no racism, according to uh, Jacques Derrida. Therefore we must know language in order to know racism that even though words are not made of matter, right? They're not things coming out of my mouth that I can touch, right? Words do matter, even if they aren't made of matter. Here, for example, a field of representation in education is this notion of the math gene, according to what Nirol Shah, my former uh, collaborator, talks about in a Harvard Ed Review piece of how Asian Americans are portrayed as the model minority. Now, the model minority is a recent myth. We must understand that, right? It is in the context of, of the, brown, the brown and black power movements that to, to, to discipline Latinx and black folks, right, into um, um, being placable, right? The model minority Asian was introduced. Why can't black and Latino folks be more like them? They wouldn't have the problems they then have, right? But this is a very tentative position to be in because it can be taken away. And as we know now, especially in, in the recent years of anti-Asian violence and the anti-Chinese rhetoric of uh, former President Trump of calling COVID the Chinese virus, we know that this model minority status can be taken away in a moment's notice. Vincent Chin knew that very well. So here we return to race's real and non-real properties of how it's made up and how it's real. And so we enter the last part here uh, next slide, please, of the politics of representation of this uh, photo around 2008 when Obama's, uh, pre President Obama, President candidate Obama then was running. And Ann Leibowitz, the photographer, uh, wanted to provoke a national conversation about race when she put out this Vogue representation of um, uh, player, uh, basketball player, NBA great uh, LeBron James, and uh, also Giselle um, being clutched here by, by LeBron James. And this was juxtaposed to uh, a World War I uh, advertisement against Germans and German soldiers portrayed here as the brute, as the ape, as the savage, holding the, you know, the traditional European bat of kultur or culture. Right, and you can see the similarities in the portrayal here. Now there's a, a bar in the middle, I call a bar, a, a line in the middle. That line to me is a subtle line of history of how Germans portrayed as brutes on the left. And, 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 I, and we have to understand here that um, uh, the stand-in switches, right? That Giselle becomes the German white in the second half of the century, whereas Germans were the brute in the first half of the century, right? So what we see here is the assimilation of Germanness into whiteness, right? And what we have is a substitution of the German brute to the black brute portrayed here as an NBA or athletic player in general in LeBron James. I won't, I won't um, go further into because we don't have the time, but this is a very interesting piece that uh, Ann Leibowitz um, asked us. Now, whiteness is in the background. Ann Leibowitz, um, um, uh, the, the question of German, Germanness and Jewishness is in the background to the extent 
that um, you can't talk about Germans and Germany without the Holocaust here. And so I think the transformation of, 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 of the line here does not just focus on blackness and whiteness, but there is a subtle text of Jewish whiteness that could be talked about here. And I'll end this segment here to go on to the next slide, please. Now we know that on November 28th, something happened, something significant happened when white hegemony in the white office, pun intended, uh, was transformed by putting a black president there, right? Yeah, and, and I see the chat here that Brazilianness, Latinx, and therefore white Latin, white Latinoness is also represented. Thank you. Um, that something significant happened in uh, whiteness and race relations in 2008. Next slide, please. So that it was a precedent for race in this race for president. And here I want to provoke a conversation that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. And I use race ambivalence as rough equivalent of post-race. I don't have any problem with post-race because I have a way of explaining that in a way that Bill O'Reilly doesn't, or ex he explains it differently. To me, post-race isn't after race, right? To me, post in postmodernism, in post-colonialism, such as Edward Said's book, he, Said is not talking about after the relevance of colonialism. He is exactly talking about colonialism. The post is, for all practical purposes, a new place for race analysis, because race is not in the past. It is in the post. It is not in the past, it is in the post. And just to return to LeBron James and basketball, it is the idea of posting up, posting up on race and colonialism, right? If you know in basketball at all, right? The, the, the power forward posts in the bottom of the court, right? Asks for the ball in the post. It is a suggestion that our analysis shifts again about race. So I don't have a problem with post, but because it is a problem to say post-race, I might favor race ambivalence as a way of as a way in, as a way of asking questions that are CRT inspired, that is Marxist inspired, that is whiteness studies inspired, and that is inspired by understanding politics of representation. So my race ambivalence is asking the question of what has race made of us that we no longer agree with, right? What have we become as a result of race in, Af for example, in Afrofuturism? Yes, it is a question of what is the future of race? What is the future of blackness? And it is different from the question in whiteness, which is if whiteness is to be abolished, it doesn't necessitate that blackness is abolished. Perhaps the abolishing of whiteness is precisely the beginning of blackness the way blacks would have it, right? That the end of whiteness is not the end of blackness, the end of indigeneity, the end, the end of, you know, the end of um, Asianness, and the end of Latinx. It is precisely the beginning of those histories, those no, new histories, as those populations would have it. Right. So, in fact, going back to Marx, it's not just the end of, you know, of color. It's the dictatorship of blackness, the dictatorship of indigeneity, et cetera. And I will end there. And I think we have about 15 minutes here or so to talk about in, um, in Q&A these issues. So thank you very much. I will end there and uh, engage your questions. <laughs>